Hi everyone, uh, welcome to lecture 9. Uh, this lecture is a continuation of the previous lecture on Newton's laws. In that lecture I gave you Newton's laws in a conceptual form and we did some very simple problems that were meant to illustrate uh, Newton's laws but they were not very deep problems. In this lecture we're actually going to use Newton's laws to start solving uh, more and more complicated problems. Okay, uh, this lecture does not have any uh, um, calculus in it and it doesn't require any calculus so it's uh, for both the calc and the uh, non-calc students. Let me quickly remind you of uh, Newton's three laws. Um, so the first law basically says in the absence of a net force an object which is not moving continues at, to stay at rest and an object which is moving continues to move at constant velocity in a straight line. Okay or more concisely you can state it as uh, in the absence of a net force an object has no acceleration. Okay where acceleration should be understood as either a change in the velocity or a turn a change in the direction of the velocity not just the magnitude okay and so that's the first law the second law is uh, basically a is equal to f net over m all right or sometimes uh, f, f net is equal to ma uh, and um, where f net is the net force on the object uh, there might be more than one force but you have to add them up as vectors which is actually the most difficult part of these problems okay and then once you have the net force uh, divide that by m and that gives you the uh, acceleration okay also uh, the third uh, second law states that uh, the net force and the acceleration are in the same direction okay the third law is a little different uh, it actually pairs objects so it states that if object a exerts a force on object b then object b exerts a force back on object a which is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction okay and so if your problem only has one object which you're worried about then the third law really doesn't apply but you know we're going to have uh, problems where we have several objects and they're going to be interacting with one another and then you do have to make use of the third law Okay, so uh, let's start off. We're going to start off with some simple problems and then the, the problems will get more and more complicated as we go along. And I'll also introduce some new ideas such as friction. Okay, all right. So here's our first problem. And what we have here is a block and this block is a five kilogram block. Okay, and I'm going to put it on a, a, an incline plane. So an incline plane is just, it could be like a table, but you're just going to incline it. And here I have it inclined at 30 degrees. Okay, and uh, for now, the surface is going to be frictionless, which basically means, you know, that there's no rubbing between the two surfaces. So you could see I actually drew the block slightly above the, uh, the, the incline plane like that. And then I'm just going to let go. And I think you can easily imagine what's going to happen. And this thing is going to slide downhill and as it slides it actually accelerates okay and we'll see that come out in the problem you'll do something like this in the lab because in the lab you're going to have linear air tracks and what linear air tracks are is there are tracks on which you can put these gliders and the tracks have air which comes out of holes and that makes the glider just float on top of the track so that there's minimal friction there's always a little bit of friction because of the air friction but very minimal friction and you know you'll you'll just tap the glider and then it'll start to move and certainly if it's inclined this way the glider will accelerate downhill very um, very evidently okay <clears throat> so uh, so here I say uh, a mass of five kilograms is placed on a frictionless plane inclined at 30 degrees find the acceleration okay so uh, how do we proceed well um, <clears throat> this diagram already has a few steps involved so let's go through how I would draw how I would uh, develop the diagram the first thing is just draw the inclined plane and the box there like that in other words just reproduce this diagram like that now my English is actually simple enough that you don't even need the diagram uh, you know you could just begin by drawing that diagram directly from the uh, description uh, from the word problem draw that first okay the next thing that you're going to do is identify all the forces that are acting on the object Okay. Now there's not an infinity of different possibilities and so you can go through uh, each of the possibilities one at a time and just ask yourself is that force uh, uh, applicable to this particular situation or not. So um, all of our problems are going to be on the surface of the earth so there's always a force of gravity on all of our uh, blocks. So over here you can see I have a block here like that and I put a little dot in the middle. All right, We're not worried about the extent of the object. Gravity really does act diffusely over the entire object, but let's not worry about that. That's when we get to extended objects later in the course. Right now you could just draw a little dot in the middle of the, um, the block here like that, and then just draw the force of gravity. And which way does the force of gravity act? Straight down. Okay, so I would draw the dot and then draw it straight down. And then you ask yourself, well, is there another force? 
Well, uh, there's other forces that you can think about, but probably the next uh, force to look at is forces of touching between surfaces, okay? So whenever one surface touches up against another surface like this, there's what's known as a normal force, okay? And normal just means perpendicular to the, um, to the area. Uh, and I, I can't draw the area here because we're looking at the side, but you know, this is an inclined plane. Plane means it's like, you know, a flat area here. And the normal force is perpendicular to it. In other words, at 90 degrees to it. So over here in the middle, I've got this normal force and I drew it in there like that. Okay. And then you might ask yourself, well, is there any other force? Is someone pulling or pushing on this thing? No. Nah. Is there any friction here? No, nah, it's, it's a frictionless surface. And so, you know, after you've gone through all the possibilities, and like I said, there's not that many of them by the end of this lecture you will know all those possibilities uh, you'll go okay well I've identified all the forces that are involved so what are the forces that are involved in this one there's gravity straight down and the normal force that way okay so once again just draw the picture without any forces and then draw the forces that are acting on the object okay at this point you have the beginnings of what's called a free body diagram and a free body diagram just basically means that you've isolated the object and you're, you've identified the forces that are on that object. Now, the next step is going to be to add up all the forces in a vector uh, as vectors. Okay. Now that's the, like I said, that's the hard part. So, you know, when we add up vectors, I really showed you only one way to do it and that's with Cartesian components. And so you're going to have to break up the uh, vectors into X and Y components. Okay. And you take a look at this diagram and before you look at the coordinate system here, so I know it's tilted, just imagine that you didn't see that coordinate system. You go, geez, this isn't as easy as the problems I did in last lecture because last lecture, all the problems aligned with either up or down down, you know, the y-axis or the align with the x-axis. Okay, they made this nice little cross. Okay, and that made life easy because components in the vertical components, the components in the y direction, they added, and the components in the x direction, they added, and the y and the x, they didn't inter interfere with one another. They were independent of one another. It was very easy to work things out. Okay, but here it's not so easy because fg, the force due to gravity, is not opposite fn. They're at some angle to one another and so they don't directly uh, cancel one another. Okay, <clears throat> Some component of fg cancels against F, fn but some component actually is down the incline plane and causes this thing to accelerate. Okay, So at this point you go all right well how should I how should I deal with this and um, it's not obvious how you want to place your coordinate system but the, probably the best choice is to place the coordinate system tilted like this such that the x-axis is actually parallel to the inclined plane and the y-axis is perpendicular to it. In this particular problem you could have done it this way or you could have done it you know with uh, y vertical and x horizontal but you'll see later especially when I add friction that this will be the better choice okay. So let's stick with this choice for now and it'll become like I said it'll become clear why this is a good choice all right. So if you choose your inclined plane like this you go well that's kind of weird it's on an angle you could turn your head you know tilt your head and look at it and go all right fine uh, fn that's purely parallel to the y-axis. So Fn has only a y component to it. There's no x component to Fn. So life with Fn is pretty easy. Okay. Uh, I don't know what Fn is going to equal. Let me see. I, th I think it turns out to be 43 newtons. Uh, but you know, let's just say for a second here that Fn is 43 newtons. That 43 newtons is purely y. So there's an Fn y, which is 43 newtons, and Fn x, the x component of Fn, parallel to the plane here is zero. Okay. And so that's the story with Fn. It'll turn out to be very easy. It's Fg that's hard here. Why? Because Fg will have not only a component parallel to the plane, but also a component perpendicular to the plane. In other words, there'll be an Fgx and an Fgy. Okay. So it'll actually break up into two components. Okay. So that's where we're going to head with this. All right. So um, before I actually even calculate the magnitude of Fg, Let's think about how we're going to split up FG into this FGX and FGY. Okay. Now this diagram, it's not the best diagram, but this it's sufficient. Uh, this diagram, you don't have to redraw it every single time. Okay. Uh, to break this up, the easiest way to do it, break it up into X and Y components. The easiest way to do it is to use a triangle. To use triangles. Okay. And you know that you know um, getting your uh, X and Y components 
from uh, polar coordinates requires the sine and cosines and sines and cosines are all about right angle triangles okay and so uh, if you scroll back up to here it's not obvious where the triangle is here but we can make a triangle like this we've got part of the plane here like that there's the bottom of the like the, the horizontal portion of the table here like that and then there's the vector there like that okay and you can see here that I drew that the, well the inclined plane here is 30 degrees if that's 30 degrees then this angle in there must also be 30 degrees okay you'll see that in just a second all right so how does that work out okay so here we go here's the plane that's inclined at 30 degrees here's my FG going straight down and you can see it forms this right angle triangle right in there okay now right angle triangles the sum of all the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees one angle is 90 degrees so these two other angles must add up to 90 if this is 30 then that angle right in there is 60 degrees okay now I put this dashed line right in there and that dashed line represents uh, uh, the normal okay and of course normal means that it's perpendicular so if this is 60 degrees and the whole angle in there is 90 degrees, well then that little wedge in there has to be 30 degrees. Okay, so back to this diagram here. If the plane is inclined at 30 degrees, then that angle in there must be 30 degrees, okay? You don't have to rethink this every time, okay? And so I'm just showing you this once to convince you that this is a correct way of thinking about it. But you know, if this angle in here is 30 degrees, when you draw this diagram, then that angle in there is gonna be 30 degrees. And even though our diagrams our problems are going to become more and more complicated every time we have an inclined plane you're going to have fg at some angle to the normal whatever the angle of the inclined plane is that's the angle that fg makes with the normal okay the normal being extended down here is that dashed line okay and so you know um, that's my little proof of that to try to convince you that that's why it works out the way that it does okay so again you don't have to redraw this every time you don't have to rethink the geometry uh, here i had um, uh, 30 degrees but suppose in another problem I give you 45 degrees well then if this is 45 degrees well then that's 45 degrees what if this is 25 degrees well then that's 25 degrees and so on okay so great we've uh, identified that this angle in here is 30 degrees and you go well now what because remember where we're trying to go we're trying to get an FGX component and an FGY component okay and um, we're going to break our rules a little bit from how I showed you how to get FGX and FGY. And the reason is, is you see that 30 degrees there? That 30 degrees isn't with the positive X axis, is it? It's with the Y axis. And when I introduce the whole way of doing sine and cosine to get from polar to Cartesian coordinates, I said, you must measure theta with respect to the positive X axis. Well, the positive X axis, you can see the direction there, it would be up that way. You'd have to measure all the way around to there. Okay, oh, sorry, do that again. All the way around to there. Now, that's a little bit annoying, and it's not intuitive, and students tend to get confused. Here's a much way, easier way to do it. Just redraw uh, a, um, <clears throat> a triangle here. Okay, just redraw the triangle. So this here, going straight down, that's FGY. Okay, and we want a component FGX along this way and FGY along that way. Okay, now remember how sine and cosine actually work sine is actually the uh, here let me scroll down a bit sine is actually the opposite uh, angle in a right angle triangle and the cosine is for the adjacent so you see here the 30 degrees like that to get fgy notice it's adjacent that means that the 30 degrees actually goes from the hypotenuse to the adjacent there like that so we've got here fgy okay there's a 30 degrees in there okay that FGY, that's actually the adjacent. So in this case, for FGY, you use the cosine. I know previously I said sine for the Y, but that's only if you were measuring the angle from the positive X axis. Since we're measuring it to actually the Y axis there, that turns out to be the cosine. FGX, the X component of FG, by uh, similar um, reasoning, has to be the sine. Remember, the sine is the opposite. So here's the 30 degrees opposite that is this little segment here that I have in dashed line but that segment is exactly the same length as that segment in there okay so um, that's how we're, we're going to proceed let me go through it in, in, in more detail I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview first okay and once you've memorized this and you've committed this to memory then all of the problems are going to follow the same kind of pattern you're not going to have to rethink 
the logic over and over and over again. You know how it works and you can just go more directly to the answer, okay? But, you know, having in introduced this for the first time, you know, I don't want to create confusion and say, oh, you know, the y component in this case is cosine. You go, why is that case? I've got to give you an explanation. And there's the explanation. Because here, that 30 degrees, it's not the 30 degrees, it's not the angle made with the positive x-axis. That angle in there is between FGY and the actually in the negative y axis. And so, yeah, that, we have to rethink it. And the adjacent is the cosine and the opposite is the sine. Okay, so let's go through it in detail. First, you've got FG straight down. Okay, so FG, that's the weight of this box. And you say, well, how do I calculate the weight? And you remember last lecture, FG, the weight of something is equal to MG. It's mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So FG is equal to MG. M, I told you, was 5 kilograms. G, we're going to approximate to 10 meters per second squared. And so this box has a weight of 50 newtons. Okay, weight, force of gravity, 50 newtons, straight down. That's the hypotenuse in this triangle. Okay, so great. Now we know how big FG is. And we even know its direction. It's straight down. But now we want FGX. And you go, okay, FGX here, that's actually the opposite. This, this line, line segment here and FGX there, that line segment there, they're the same size, okay? Okay, because it's a part of the tri right angle triangle here, okay? And so you go, all right, FGX, and here I go 50 newtons, but I use the sine because it is the opposite. This length here is opposite that 30 degrees there, okay? And that length there is the same as FGX. So you're saying, why am I looking at this length in here? Well, because that length there is exactly the same length as FGX. See, that dashed line and that da and the y-axis or the, yeah, the y-axis are actually parallel to one another. So that line segment there is the same length as that. That line segment is the opposite of the 30 degrees, so you use the sine. Okay, so FGX is FG, 50 newtons times the sine of 30 degrees. And FGY is going to be the cos, uh, 50 newtons times the cosine of 30 degrees. Okay, and if you just plug that through your calculator, you'll find that FGX is 25 newtons and FGY is 43.3 newtons. Okay, so ask yourself if those numbers make sense. The components, the X and Y components, have to always be smaller than FG, okay, than the, the hypotenuse, okay? And so FG is 50 newtons and fgx is 25 that's smaller yeah and fg sorry fgx is 25 and fgy is 43.3 yeah so they kind of make sense all right so what we've effectively done is we've taken this vector here and we've decomposed it into a y component and an x component if you add the x component and the y component you get the original vector back why well let's do it this way you can go start with the x component first and then you add the y component and you'll wind up where fg points or you could do the y component first and then add in the x component and you'll get to the same point again so fg is basically the sum of fgx plus fgy okay and what does that mean it means i can take out of my free body diagram i can remove fg and replace it with fgx and fgy and nothing has changed okay so up here in the original free body diagram i had fgx there like that and now i'm going to take that out and I'm going to replace it with FGX down the inclined plane and FGY perpendicular to the inclined plane. If need be, you might have to redraw uh, your uh, free body diagram so you don't get confused. Okay, so that's what I did here. I redrew the free body diagram. You can see the inclined plane there like that. Here's my box. And you'll notice I don't have FGY, uh, sorry, FG going straight down. I have FGY here and I have FGX. Okay, and FGY was 43.3 newtons and FGX was 25 newtons. Okay, so at this point, we have um, a free body diagram and notice that all the forces are lining up along that, that cross. Okay, so either they're along the Y axis or they're along the X axis. All right, and that means that adding the vectors becomes very easy. All right, so um, the first thing that we do might want to look at is the uh, acceleration in the y component okay and see we have fgy but we don't have fn and you go well what would fn be but if you take a look here there is no acceleration in the y direction 
So acceleration in the y direction, what would it mean? It would be mean acceleration perpendicular to the inclined plane. But the motion is purely parallel to the inclined plane. If there were an acceleration perpendicular to the inclined plane, either the box would be lifting up off of the inclined plane or it'd be digging into it. And neither of those things happens. It's purely, you know, the motion is purely along x. So a y, the acceleration along the y direction that is perpendicular to the plane must be zero. Well, invoke the first law. If there is no acceleration in the y direction, then there must be no net force in the y direction. Okay, remember what the first law says? No acceleration, no net force, or no net force, no acceleration. And that's true of the y component independently of the x component. So just looking at the y component, no acceleration in y, no net force. What does that mean? Well, that must mean that whatever Fn is, it must completely cancel Fgy. Okay, uh, so in other words, and I've even drawn the, my little hashes here, you can see the two little hashes here and the two little hashes here. Those two forces must cancel one another to give you a net F, uh, uh, F net in the y direction of zero. Okay, and that tells you that Fn must be 43.3 so that it exactly cal uh, cancels uh, Fgy. All right, and so over here, that's what we conclude. So the, uh, I have Ay is equal to zero. And that implies that F net Y must equal zero. Okay. And that means that Fn, the normal force in the positive Y direction must exactly equal Fgy, which is in the negative direction. It's 43.3. By the way, I wrote second law here, but remember I, in a minute ago, I said the first law, remember the first law is just a special, uh, a special um, um, situation of the, uh, the second law. Okay. So I usually think in terms of the second law. So if there's, you know, even in the second law, if there's no acceleration, then there's no F net. Okay. So that's the story with the Y component. And, um, uh, you know, I didn't do it here, but you'll see that, you know, when I solve these problems, especially during the tutorials, I'll go back here and I'll say, okay, Fn is equal to 43.3. So as I solve each of the components, I'll go back and just put in those numbers into the diagram. So we now know that F net, sorry, F normal is 43.3. Okay. Uh, and now we can actually get an F net. Why? Because we know that those two forces have to cancel. What about in the x direction? Well, there's 25 newtons down, that's your FGX, but there's no force up. That is in the positive x direction. I shouldn't say up, I should say along uh, along the inclined plane upwards. Okay, so there's a, uh, an ex uh, a force in the negative x direction, but there's no force in the positive x direction. And so that 25 newtons, nothing cancels it, okay? And so in the x direction, uh, the F net, okay, so this is F net, x component only is 25 newtons okay because there was only one force in the uh, along x and it's uh, down along the inclined plane and there it is and so now you can use the second law and say okay the acceleration down the inclined plane is going to be the, the net force x component only uh, divided by the mass okay so that's newton's second law there okay and 25 newtons divided by 5 kilograms gives you 5 meters per second squared okay that's the magnitude of the acceleration and which way is it? Well, the second law also says that the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. The net force was down the inclined plane, so the acceleration has to be down the inclined plane, okay? Now, I went through that in a lot of detail and you might get lost with all the detail, okay? A lot of that detail was to really explain why this procedure works. As we go on, we'll skip some of the steps or at least some of the reasoning in the steps because we have already convinced ourselves in particular convince ourselves that those steps work. In particular, this part right here, the whole geometry thing, it's really annoying to have to rethink it every time. So what I recommend is that you really get the get you know this pattern in your mind and that what is that pattern you know if the inclined plane here is 30 degrees then the angle made by the uh, force of gravity to the um, to the y-axis here is 30 degrees and if that's 30 degrees then you can break it up into uh, an x and y component Okay, so you have FGY and FGX, and FGYX is FG sine of the angle, and FGY is FG cosine of the angle. Okay, so and so just keep that in mind. Okay, you go over it a couple of times, you'll 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 commit it to memory. All right, so there's our first problem, and uh, you know we solved you know how uh, we solved what we asked for which was what is the acceleration and the acceler the answer is the acceleration is down the inclined plane at 5 meters per second squared that's half a g okay half a g
All right. Well, let's start making the uh, our problems a little bit more complicated. Whoops, scroll down a bit too far. Uh, so this example here is repeat the previous problem, but assume uh, there is friction with coefficient mu k equals 0 0.2. Okay, so uh, I have to explain what this mu k is here, uh, which I'll do uh, as the problem uh, progresses. But in this case, we actually ha do have friction. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the box and the... Um, uh, the surface of the inclined plane are actually touching against one another. And as the, the box goes downhill, it's, it's rubbing against the inclined plane and there is a bit of friction. OK, so uh, what does the free body diagram look like now? OK, so you have an inclined plane and it's still 30 degrees. It's still the same problem. OK, and you have a box here like that. And that's the first step is to just draw that. Then ask yourself what forces are acting and what and what direction are they acting in? Well, there's gravity. I usually start with gravity that's the most obvious there it is there's the force of gravity straight down and we know mg is going to be 50 newtons so there it is fg is 50 newtons and we know that that angle in there is 30 degrees because we convinced ourselves that that's how it works if this is 30 degrees there that's going to be 30 degrees there like that okay great we've got fg next what other forces there well there's still fn okay there it is OK, be careful. Don't just jump to the conclusion that this Fn is going to be the same as in the previous problems. Things could have changed. So we know that Fn is perpendicular to the inclined plane, but we don't know how big it is. So don't write in Fn is equal to 43. This one we know because if you rethink it, Fg is equal to mg. M is still 5. Uh, G is still 10. So that's 50 newtons. But here things could change and we'll see what comes out afterwards. But now we have another force. So, so far, Fg and Fn, that was the same as in the previous problem, but now we have Ff, okay? And you ask yourself, well, what direction is Ff in? That's the force of friction, okay? Well, if the block is going, is moving, its velocity is downhill, then the force of friction has to be uphill. The force of friction always is in the opposite direction to the velocity. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But yeah, if the block is going downhill, what's slowing down the block as it moves downhill is the force of friction uphill. OK, so here we go. There's a force of friction up here and uh, we'll call that F F there like that. And I have my coordinate system in there because that's the next thing I'll add. So so, you know, I identified uh, three forces. You might say, is there any other force? But I think it's pretty obvious. Those are the three forces, gravity, normal force and friction. OK, and then as the next step, after you've identified the forces, then draw in the coordinate system. And I'm going to put my coordinate system with the X axis parallel and my y-axis perpendicular to the plane. And I think now you can see why it was an advantageous to do this. Because CFF, it's purely along the x-direction. And CFN, it's purely along the y-direction. Okay, So there's nothing to decomposing FF into its x and y component. FF is purely x component. There is no y component to FF. And FN is purely y component. There's no x component to it. So these two they're trivial to work with. It's FG that's a problem, but we know how to deal with that. Okay, and so the next step is I'm going to redraw the diagram again, the free body diagram, and I'm going to put FF up the inclined plane and FN perpendicular to the inclined plane. Leave leave those two alone. But I'm going to remove FG, and because it's not uh, parallel to either X or Y. Uh, directions, I'm going to remove it, and I'm going to replace it with FGY and FGX. OK, and FGY and FGX, they are um, parallel to, well, FGX is parallel to the X axis and FGY is parallel to the Y axis. OK, so I'm going to immediately break those up. All right. And now I'm going to say, can I start to put numbers to these things? All right. Well, um, FG we know is 50 newtons and you go, well, is there an FGY? Yeah, FGY over here, that was just your 50 newtons cosine of the uh, 30 degrees. Let me just scroll up to show you those numbers again. I didn't repeat the formulas, but there they are. Okay, so FGY was 50 cosine 30 and FGX is 50 sine 30. The angle didn't change, the magnitude didn't change, and so the values of the numbers remain the same. So FGY here is 43.3 and FGX is 25 newtons. The same as in the previous problem. Okay, so I wrote them here, but um, you know, if I were doing the problem interactively with you, uh, you know, I would have uh, uh, just drawn these and I would going to go, I would put here, I would actually write in, oh, that's going to equal 43.3. And then over here, I would say, oh, that's going to equal 25 because the more numbers you start to see in the diagram, the easier it becomes. Okay. 
And then the next thing is you say to yourself, well, uh, do I want to look at X first or do I want to look at Y first? And uh, the Y component is the easier one in this case to look at. So you say, okay, is there any acceleration in the Y direction? And no, there isn't. OK, uh, for the same reasons as above, because if there were acceleration in the y direction, that would mean there'd be an acceleration, there'd be motion perpendicular to the plane. And that means the box would be either lifting off the plane or digging into the plane. Well, that's not happening. So uh, there is uh, no acceleration in the y direction. And that means that Fn must exactly cancel Fgy. All right. But we just said that FGY is 43.3. So guess what? Fn must be 43.3. OK, now that is what we concluded above that fy means that fn must be 43.3 but you know uh, be careful if you're not sure don't just jump to the conclusion if there's a variation in the problem that the numbers will stay the same you'll see in some problems i'll make some small variation and even though you have the same forces in terms of you know their type and direction their magnitude changes because other things in the problems change okay so just be very careful rethink each of the steps all right so since fgy is 43.3 fn must be 43.3 OK, great. FGX we know is 25 newtons, but what about this FF? Do we know how big it is? And the answer is yes, we actually do. And that's where that mu k comes in. OK, so <clears throat> let me show you how kinetic friction works. Whoops, scroll down just a bit more. OK, so how kinetic friction works. OK, so first of all, mu by itself, uh, what is that? That's the Greek letter mu. It, it, it's an M, okay, but in Greek. It kind of looks like this U here, like that, okay? And some people will say it's a U, but it is, and it's got this extra long little tail at the beginning here, like that. It's drawn up like that, okay? And so it's called mu, all right? And uh, it's a coefficient. Now, there's two different types of, of uh, coefficients of friction, okay? There's a coefficient of, and I inserted here, kinetic friction, and you'll see in a minute there's a coefficient of static friction. But right now we want the kinetic friction because there's actually motion. Okay, I'll define those two a little bit uh, more clearly later. So we got mu k, which is this coefficient of uh, uh, kinetic friction. But how do you work it out? It's actually a dimensionless number. That is a number without any units associated with it. Okay, and what it is is it's a ratio between the force of friction and the normal force. Okay, so let's take a look at my diagram again here. Actually, we can even go back to the original diagram. Notice that the force of friction and the normal force, they're perpendicular to one another. And you go, well, what's going on here? Um, you know, how is the force of friction related to the normal force? And uh, it's it's related through this mu k because what it's mu k is trying to, to the, the intuition it's trying to give you is that the harder two surfaces push against one another, the harder it is to get them to slide across one another. Okay, so you can even do this with your hands. If they're just lightly touching, then it's very easy to slide them. But if I press really hard, then it gets harder to slide one past the other. The bigger Fn is, the harder the two surfaces are touching. Okay, that's what Fn is. It's the touching of the two surfaces. The bigger Fn is, the bigger the force of friction is because they're, they're more interlocking at the mi microscopic level. The two surfaces are interlocking and it's that interlocking which leads to friction, just to give you some intuition. So if you double Fn, you're going to double mu k. If you triple Fn, you're going to triple mu k. They're in linear relationship to one another, okay? And that constant of linear proportionality, that is your mu k. So back here, this is the definition of mu k. Mu k is just how much friction you get per Newton of normal force, okay? Increase Fn, you'll increase FF, okay? And you say, well, how, what's the proportionality between the two? That's mu k, and I've got to give you that. Or, or, or maybe I, I ask you to calculate that in a problem, or I'm going to have to give it to you. And in this problem, I told you it was 0.2, okay? I didn't give you units because there are no units. Why are there no units? Well, because FF is in Newtons, Fn is in Newtons, Newtons will cancel Newtons, okay? So mu k is kind of a... Um, uh, it is a dimensionless number, okay? And that point two, you can actually interpret it as a percentage. You could say it's like 20%. Okay, so point two, a mu k of point two just means that the force of friction is 20% of whatever the normal force is, okay? So that's the way you should think about it. It's the relative size of the uh, force of friction to the normal force. All right, so rearranging that formula because we're trying to solve for FF, okay? FF is going to be equal mu k times Fn. We just determined that Fn was 43.3 newtons, multiply that by 0.2 and you find that the force of friction is 8.66 newtons. 
Okay, so again, if I were doing this interactively, I would go back to this and I would just write in here uh, what the value there is, 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 and then I would have them all. But I just redrew it here because uh, I didn't want to, I kind of want to show you the steps in which my diagram is evolving. So here it is. Here's my evolved the diagram. Okay, I've got FGY, Y component of, of the weight, 43.3. It has to exactly balance. The normal force, 40, meaning that the normal force must be 43.3, and those two will cancel. You can see my little hashes there. Okay, those will cancel. The frictional force we determined through mu k was 8.66 newtons, and then there was a x there was an an x component of the weight, which is 25 newtons down. Okay, if you look at this diagram, the y components cancel, but the x components don't. Okay, the 25 newtons, yeah, it's being countered by that 8.66 newtons, but, yeah, and it's winning, but, you know, it's not the total, okay? And so the net force in the x direction, the net force in the y direction is zero, we just said that, but the net force in the x direction is going to be FGX minus FF, okay? So it's 25 newtons pulling you down, but 8.66 pulling you up for a total of 16.34 newtons. There's your net force, okay, along the x direction. Now, once you have the net force along the x direction, okay, x component of F net, divided by the mass, that gives you the acceleration in the x direction. And I put in the numbers there, crunch through my calculator, and I got 3.3 meters per second squared, okay? So in this case, what we have is that the block is going to accelerate down the plane at 3.3 meters per second squared, okay? Let's ask ourselves, does that make sense? In the previous problem, when there was no friction, it was 5 meters per second squared. In this problem, when there is friction, it's 3.3, .3, which is less, and that makes sense. Okay? All right. So there you go. There's our second problem. Okay? Uh, when you get good at these, you know, you're not going to take as long as I'm taking right now. I'm really going through every step because, you know, you may, once you understand the steps, it's, it's like you can't unlearn them. OK, so, you know, if you feel a little over overwhelmed, you know, you can watch the video a few times, go through it yourself. OK, uh, so repeat what I'm doing, even with the same numbers and everything. And then you'll start to see, ah, yeah, I can see how this is evolving. And then when you do the next problem, half of the steps are the same as the previous. Well, more than half. Most of the steps are the same as the previous problem. It gets easier. OK, uh, before we go on to the next problem, though, I do have to say something about friction. OK, so there's two types of friction. There's the kinetic friction, and kinetic, you, know, you already has a sense, means motion or moving. Uh, so kinetic friction is the friction between two surfaces that slide past one another, okay? And uh, here I've shown you a couple of situations, but I should probably look at this diagram first, okay? So in the examples, uh, the example that I just did, I had this uh, block here, and it was accelerating downhill. And we implicitly, without me actually saying it, the velocity obviously was downhill too, OK, so if the thing is moving downhill, then the force of friction has to be up, uphill. The force of friction is always opposite the velocity, not the acceleration. This is a very subtle point, but let's think about why uh, uh, or how that works. OK, so the velocity is downhill. The force of friction is uphill. You can have acceleration downhill, but the box moving uphill and you go, how is that possible? Like. If it's going to accelerate downhill, won't it start to move downhill? Won't it have a velocity downhill? No, not if I gave it a push uphill, an initial push uphill. So you can imagine that I you know, gave this block a really good push uphill. So it goes uphill, stops, and then turns around and comes back downhill. Okay, But while, I've, while it's going uphill, the velocity is up the inclined plane. The acceleration is still in the opposite direction. That's what's going to slow it down, stop, and then bring it back down. Okay, Believe it or not, the friction is actually in the same direction as acceleration or opposite the velocity in this case, okay? So the velocity uphill, the friction is downhill. And so that's kind of subtle. I'm not going to throw these subtleties at you, but I, I do want to be accurate in my uh, description of what's going on here. The force of friction, kinetic friction, is opposite the direction of the velocity, not the acceleration. So in these diagrams, even though I drew the acceleration, just ignore the acceleration. V is uphill, F is downhill. V is downhill, FF is uphill, okay? And of course, then the magnitude is going to be uh, FF divided by FN. Okay, uh, so not the magnitude, but the coefficient of kinetic friction is FF divided by FN. Okay, so there you go. There's the story with uh, kinetic friction, and you already saw a problem with that. Uh, what about static friction? 
This is actually the harder of the two to, to get your head around. Static friction is the friction between two surfaces where they're stuck together and neither one is moving. So, you know, if I have two surfaces like a, uh, or a block, say here a block sitting on top of that, and the block's not moving, then between the block and the surface, there's static friction. Even if I push a little bit on the block, it's not going to move because static friction is going to prevent it from moving. OK, and so now if you ask how big is the uh, static friction, we'll call that FS for static friction here. OK, how big is the static friction? Uh, believe it or not, it's whatever it has to be such that the net force is zero. So that's a, that's that's a really weird way of thinking about it. It means the force of static friction will adjust itself to whatever it has, has to be such that F net is zero. Well, why is F net zero? If the object is not moving, the acceleration is zero, and by the first law, that means that F net is zero. Okay, so that static friction, it can't be anything, it's got to be whatever, it's going to adjust itself, it's going to grow or shrink until it gets to the point where F net is zero. Why? Because it's going to prevent the box from moving, okay, or block. Uh, all right, so um, that's the first thing to keep in mind. Okay. The second thing is, is that the force of static friction can't just grow on forever. Okay. So if I've got my box on top of a surface and I push on it, force of static friction will adjust and stop it. I push harder, the force of static friction will push harder in the opposite direction. But at some point, I'm going to push hard enough that I'm going to overcome the static friction and then the box will start to move. Okay. And so the static friction here can't be just any old amount. It has to be less than a threshold and that threshold is called the coefficient of static friction. So I wrote a little less here. The previous one was mu k, the coefficient of kinetic friction. Friction. This one is the coefficient of static friction. But notice that this is not an equality. This is an inequality. So it doesn't. You can't use this equation to evaluate the value of f s. You can only use this equation to determine the threshold at which f s is not sufficiently big enough or can't grow big enough to stop the object from moving. If the object is not moving, then this equality must hold. Fs must be small enough such that it doesn't go over the threshold here of mu s. Okay, so I, I kind of drew a diagram here to try to give you an idea of what's going on. Never mind the, the forces up and down vertically. Let's just, so yeah, there's going to be a force of gravity down than a normal force, but just concentrate on these two forces. I've got Fp here, and that's me pushing. And assume the box is not moving. That's why I wrote here V is equal to zero meters per second. It's not moving. Okay. So if I push on this box with 10 newtons, if that's the only force there is horizontally, it would start to accelerate because F net would be 10 newtons. But it's not accelerating. So F net must be zero. So if FP is 10 newtons, then there must be a force in the opposite direction, 10 newtons, which prevents the box from moving. That's your static friction. Okay. So the static friction here is equal to FP. Now, suppose I push a little harder. So now I push at 15 newtons. Well, if it's still not moving, if this is, if my push is 15 newtons, newtons then guess what? The static friction must have grown to 15 newtons, newtons such that the two will cancel one another. Okay. And you can imagine like you mean me doing this gradually. I started 10 newtons. Static friction is 10 newtons. I push it up to 11 newtons. The static friction grows to 11 newtons. I push 12 newtons. Static friction grows to 12 newtons. I push up to 15 newtons. Static friction goes up to, to, to 15 newtons. Okay, But at some point, I'm going to push hard enough. What's going to happen? The box is going to start to move. When does that happen? When this equality breaks. When this equality is no longer true. As soon as FS, CFS has to be less than a certain amount. As soon as FS, it grows, it grows, it grows, it grows. It grows so big that the inequality is no longer true. That's the point at which the box breaks free. Okay, so this is conceptually much more difficult, uh, in my opinion, than the kinetic friction. Okay, and so problems here with static friction are more problems like uh, how big could FS be before it uh, uh, before the the object starts to move. Okay, so you can ask questions about threshold and stuff like that. All right, so um, you'll actually do a lab on this. All right, so 
uh, if, if this isn't a big isn't too clear it's a bit fuzzy right now it'll it'll become a lot clearer we're gonna you're gonna do a lab and the lab is actually based off of my example or my example is based off of the lab okay and so uh, here's an example and uh, let's read the, the the English first because the diagram looks like the, the diagram from before okay but the situation is different so let's read it and by the way I'm not going to use numbers in this okay now I'm not going to do a lot of problems where I don't use numbers but because you're going to use this formula in a lab and some Sometimes you'll want, you know, um, uh, uh, relationships between just the quantities uh, in general. We'll, we'll just we'll just use the variables, and then we'll carry through the problem, just using the variables as if they were numbers. It's a little harder, but you know it's possible. Okay, so I have a mass m of some specified mass, but I'm not going to, you know, give you that number here. I have a mass m is placed on a plane that is inclined at a, a variable angle theta okay so what that means is that you know i can have theta zero i can incline it at one degree two degree three degree ten twenty thirty okay and just increase it like that okay so you'll actually have a little table which you can you know incline at uh, different angles and then you'll put a block on top of it and you'll see what happens okay so this mass m it's on a plane that can be inclined at a variable angle theta okay the coefficient of static friction between the mass and the surface here in the plane is mu s. Okay, again, some number, but I'm not going to give you that number, but assume that we do know that number in principle. Okay, find the range of theta such that the mass does not slide. Think about this. If the table is flat, the mass doesn't slide. If I'm at one degree, it probably doesn't slide. Two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, ten degrees. Okay, as I keep increasing the angle, at some point, the block is going to break free and start to slide. Okay, I want to know the angle at which that'll happen. And You've got everything you need the mass the angle mu s okay actually the angle will drop out and it'll only depend on theta but we'll see that in a minute okay so everyone got the picture of what i'm asking i'm saying look you've got this mass m on a on a uh, inclined plane of variable angle theta i'm going to keep increasing theta until the black block starts to slide the point at which that block starts to slide that is uh, uh, that theta is is related to mu s. Find that theta. Okay. All right. So uh, <clears throat> here's my free body diagram. I've got my block. It's on an inclined plane. Okay. There is a normal force. Well, let's start with gravity. There's gravity straight down at an angle theta to the y-axis. Uh, there is a normal force which is uh, perpendicular to the plane, and then there is a static friction force up the inclined plane. Okay, so there are the three uh, forces. Now, uh, because FG is uh, not parallel to either y or x axis, let's break it up into the x and y components. And so in my next diagram, I've got FGY, and that's equal to mg cosine theta, and FGX is equal to mg sine theta. This is a really good diagram to memorize, okay? Uh, I know it doesn't have numbers, but it shows you how uh, FGY is calculated and how FGX is calculated, okay? And you can see now that you have the characteristic cross there like that. And so FGY will uh, and FGN, they'll add and they'll have to actually have to cancel because AY is zero. And so you'll get the fact that AY is zero. The fact that AY is zero means that FN is going to equal MG cosine theta. And the um, AX, uh, that also has to be zero in this case. Okay, It wasn't previously because the block was accelerating. But here, the block is not moving at all. It's not moving in the y direction, and it's not moving in the x direction either. And so we have to have that ax is 0. And that means that fs has to exactly cancel fgx. They're like that. So you get that fs is equal to mg sine theta. So fn is mg cosine theta. fs is equal to mg sine theta. Okay. Now, what was that inequality? That inequality says that you're not going to get sliding or, or slipping uh, if mu s is greater than fs over fn. So this is the situation where it's not moving. Well, now I have a formula for mu s, it's mg sine theta, and I have a formula for fn, it's mg cosine theta. And notice, remarkably, the mg cancels on both sides. So it doesn't depend on m, and it even doesn't depend on g, which means that if you did the exact same experiment on the moon, it would start to slide at the exact same angle. And you get this inequality here, OK? And this is actually what you're going to be testing in the lab, which is mu s has to be bigger than tan theta. OK, so as long as the angle is small enough such that when you calculate the tangent of theta, it's less than mu s, it will not slide. As soon as 
the tangent of theta is bigger than mu s, it starts to slide. Okay. And so uh, just to give you some numbers, suppose that mu s is equal to one here. I said, let's, let's assume that's the case. Well, mu s equal to one uh, means that you're not going to get any uh, sliding if the tangent of theta is less than one. Okay. I don't know why I switched the direction here, but it doesn't matter. You see, I have tangent of theta has to be less than mu s. So tangent of theta has to be less than one in this case. And you say, well, what is, when is tangent of theta equal to one? And the answer is at 45 degrees. You could do this on your calculator because the inverse tangent of one is 45 degrees. So as long as the angle is less than 45 degrees, there's no slipping. Okay, and when the angle becomes greater than 45 degrees, it does start to slip. What happens at exactly 45 degrees? You're right at that critical point, and yeah, it's hard to say. You know, it depends on the details, okay? But you'll actually do this experiment because you'll take an inclined plane and you'll start to increase it. And you'll say, okay, it's not slipping, it's not slipping, it's not slipping. And then suddenly you get to a certain point and it starts to slip. And the angle at which it starts to slip, okay, that'll be the threshold angle at which this inequality breaks and that'll give you a sense of how big um, us is okay uh, it's a very tricky experiment and so uh, it, it doesn't give you the best results but it still you know proves the point okay so there you go um there's the story with uh mu s all right now uh in all of the previous problems we used uh, the first and second law okay uh, either you can think about it as just using the second law, okay, uh, in, even in situations where a is equal to zero, okay. Uh, when does the third law kick in? Well, the third law kicks in um, when um, you've got two objects and the two objects are interacting with one another, okay. So what I have here, uh, I don't have any English for this, but um, uh, the diagram pretty much describes it. I have a, a table here like this, okay, and I've got two blocks. Here's my one block. Okay, and because I've got two blocks as two masses, I'm going to use subscripts to describe them. So I have M1 here, all right, that's the mass of block number one, it's 10 kilograms, all right. But I've got a second object, here's a block over here, this is block number two, and we can call that M2, okay. So M2 is five kilograms, so I've got M1 is 10 kilograms here, and M2 here is five kilograms. And I've tied the two together with a string. So here's my string. And the string goes over a pulley like that. And here's a table like that. All right. And just to make the problem interesting, I said, you know what, there is a coefficient of kinetic friction between the table and this mass M1 here. All right. Uh, there's obviously these two are not touching. Okay, so M2, there, there's no, um, no friction on that one. But there is friction on M1 because it's pushing up against the, uh, the tabletop, which has a coefficient of friction of 0.1. Okay, and it's tied by a string. Now, uh, a couple of assumptions here. Um, uh, the first assumption is that the string is not a stretchy st string at all. And the reason you have to make that uh, assumption is because if uh, M1 moves forward, say, one centimeter, then M2 must drop one centimeter. If uh, M1 moves forward two centimeters, then M2 must drop uh, two centimeters. If it were a stretchy spring, a stretchy string, then, you know, you could say, well, maybe it stretches a little more, stretches a little. No, 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 no. Uh, the way the string works is that, it, you know, if it, it's, its length stays exactly the same all through the motion. OK, now, if moving one forward one centimeter means the other drops forward one centimeter, that means that if the velocity of one is like 10 centimeters per second, the velocity of the other one is 10 centimeters per second. And it also means that the acceleration of M1 is the same as the acceleration of m2 okay now the way i indicated that in the diagram is i've got a here and i've got a there i didn't say a1 there and a2 why because a1 and a2 are actually the same and so i'm just going to say whatever the acceleration is of m1 that's the same acceleration as m2 okay so so those a's are the same you don't have to put subscripts on it and you probably shouldn't because if you put subscripts on a, on a variable like m that suggests that there's different values for M. So M1 is different than M2, but A is the same for both of them for the reasons I just explained because the the uh, the string has a fixed length, okay? All right, so uh, that's the next thing. And uh, one more thing about this string and the pulley. Um, I'm not gonna do a full analysis of this. It, it doesn't help too much. Uh, we're gonna make use of the third law, but remember what the third law says. The third law says that if object A exerts a force on object B, object B exerts a force of equal magnitude in opposite direction on object A. Here we have two objects, A, M1 and M2. They're going to exert forces on one another through the string. But here's the trick. The string has a tension in it, so the tension on M2 is up. 
and the tension on M1 is to the to the um, uh, to the <coughs> right. OK, and up and to the right, they're not opposite directions to one another. And you go, well, doesn't the third law say that the directions have to be opposite? Yeah, they, it, it, they are. But you have to um, take into consideration yet a third body, which is the pulley here. OK, and that's the analysis that I really don't want to do. OK, so to get the direction, like to really convince yourself that the third law is working correctly in terms of the direction, you say, look, the tension on M2 is due to M1 and the tension on M1 is due to M2. Tension is a force, by the way. OK, so the force through the string is the tension on M2 due to M1. That's up. That's the same magnitude as the tension in the string on M1 due to M2. OK, so the magnitudes are the same. You go, but the directions aren't the same because the direction for M2 is up, whereas the direction for M1 is to the right. And you go, okay, they're not the same, they're not opposite directions. And that's because the pulley here kind of changes the direction. A proper analysis would mean that you'd have to have a tension there, a tension there, and then, then yet another force which on the pulley, and then everything would work out uh, uh, exactly along the third law. I don't want to do that analysis. I don't think it adds much to this. And I'm sorry for the long aside, but I did have to explain why we're going to apply the third law. But we're going to apply the third law only in terms of the magnitude uh, in the tension of the string. OK. All right. So let me repeat the problem again so that we know what what uh, what's going on here. M1 is a mass of 10 kilogram is sitting on the top of a table. OK. There's a f f there's a coefficient of kinetic friction between M1 and the table of 0.3. OK. M1 is attached by a string and pulley to a mass which is dangling off of the end of the table. And that mass M2 has five kilograms. OK. Uh, when you let the system go, how much does M1 and M2 accelerate by? Okay, so what is the acceleration of M1 and M2? All right. All right, so find A. Okay, now how do you proceed? Because this is, this is significantly more complicated. You need two free body diagrams. You need a free body diagram for M1 and you need a free body diagram for M2. Okay, so what's a free body diagram for M1 look like? Draw it. Draw just M1 by itself. Here's the table. Here's the box. Or block okay and that's the first thing you draw so tabletop and the block next ask yourself what forces are acting on this well you got the force of gravity down great that's fg how big is fg m1g why m1 why not m2 well because you're talking about mass number one so fg is equal to m1g m1 is 10 kilograms g is 10 meters per second squared so fg the weight of M1 is 100 newtons. Okay, great. We've got one force and we actually have a number and a direction straight down. Okay. Uh, next, uh, the normal force. It's straight up. Okay, it's Fn. We know that there's no acceleration up or down. Okay, vertically here. Okay. And so we know that Fn must be the same as Fg. All right. So once you, once you get good at this intuition, you don't have to redo the analysis and all the details. We know that this box isn't lifting off the table or digging into the table. There's no motion up or down. It's purely parallel to the table. And so if Fg is 100 newtons down, Fn must cancel that with 100 newtons up. Great. We've got another force. Okay. Then we have a force of friction here. And we say, well, do we know how big that is? Yes. Force of friction is in the opposite direction. It's moving uh, towards the put. Uh, the pulley, so F, uh, so M1 is moving towards the pulley, so FF is in the opposite direction, like that. Okay, and how big is it? Well, do you remember from above? We've got that mu k is equal to FF over FN, or another way to think about it is that FF is equal to mu k times FN. That point three that I gave you a minute ago, that's just thirty percent. It just says that FF is thirty percent of a hundred newtons. Okay, so FF is thirty newtons. Great. So we've actually got three of the forces. And then you say, well, is there another force? And the answer is yes. Okay, it's the string, and it's a tension force. A tension is a force through a string. Okay, and so over here, I've got another force. This is the force that's going to uh, win out in the end and pull the box towards the pulley, and that's Ft. And we don't know how big Ft is. Okay, so Ft is the force due to the tension in the rope or string. Okay. So great, there's our free body diagram. And I'm going to draw one other thing in there, A. Okay, I don't know how big is A is, but I'm going to draw that A in there because this whole thing is accelerating. And now why did I want that A there? Well, because I know that 
FN and FG cancel. So they're out of the picture. I didn't draw my little hashes there, but if I were doing this interactively with you, I'd put two hashes there and two hashes there saying those forces are no longer in the picture. What forces are in the picture here in terms of F net? Well, there's FT and there's FF. And they can't be the same size because if they were the, they were the same size, A would be zero. And this thing is moving. Okay, it will move. All right. And so it's accelerating to the right. That means that FT must be bigger than FF. Because if they were the same size, then it wouldn't be accelerating. If FF were bigger than FT, then it'd be accelerating to the left. But it's accelerating to the right. So FT has to win over FF. And so FT is um, bigger than FF. I don't know how big FT is, but I know that it's bigger. Okay. And uh, so actually here I did show you how I calculated FF. So, you know, mu K is FF over FN. So that FF is mu K times FN, just rearranging that formula. 0.3 times 100 is 30 newtons. Okay. So here we go. Here's the net force. Okay. And I gave, could even have said the net force on number one. Okay. Only the X component because the Y components totally cancel out. FT is bigger than the FF. So the net force is going to be FT minus the 30 newtons. Okay, so up to this point, never mind this equality part right here, up to this point, F net X, the X component of F net is going to be equal to FT minus 30 newtons. Okay, and then I go, that's equal to M1A. Why can I write that? Why is this equality too? true? That equality is basically Newton's second law. Okay, the first equality, F net X is equal to FF minus 30 newtons. That's just the vector sum. So that gives you F net as a vector sum. But once you've got the vector sum for F net, what does the second law say? The second law says that F net must equal MA. A lot of students get lost at this point. You know, having taught this course many years, um, I've discovered that students kind of get lost here. They get up to here and then they go, well, now what? Now that I have F net, do I have the answer? No, the answer is you want A. And what I think you lose sight of at this point, because there's a lot of things going on, the things that you lose sight of is that you wanted F net so that you could set F net equal to MA. And so once you get F net, you go, great, now I can do the last step, which is set it equal to MA. There's the second law. So you've got two equalities here, but the justification for those two equalities are different. This equality, F net, is, F net X is equal to FT minus 30, that's just vector sum. Okay. The second equality, that justification, you say, why can you set that equal? That's Newton's second law, that the net force must equal MA. Now, I said MA because I'm talking in general, but we've got to be careful. Which block are we talking about? M1. And so you want to put M1 there. Don't write M2 or don't just write M, which is worse because that's ambiguous. And, you know, you've got two masses here. You've got a 10 kilogram and a 5 kilogram. And a mistake can be made because you might put the 5 kilogram in there. But no, 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 no. We're talking only about the free body diagram here is only about M1. And so everything up to here and the Newton's second law, that's all about M1. M2 isn't in the picture yet, okay? And so, great, we've got that FT minus 30 Newtons is equal to M1A. We know M1, that's 10, and so we get this nice little equation here, which I called equation A. The tension force, FT minus 30, must equal 10A. And you go, I can't solve that. Right, you don't know FT and you don't know A. And so, this is very typical in these problems. You're going to get two unknowns and if you just analyze one of the blocks it's not going to be sufficient you're just going to get uh, you're going to get one equation with uh, two unknowns okay so here we go we got equation a from our free body diagram analysis of m1 and it's got two unknowns in it ft and a and how do you solve uh you know an equations with two unknowns you're going to need two equations okay two independent equations and where are you going to get the other equation from your free body analysis of of uh, M2. Okay, so here's my free body diagram for M2. It's pretty easy because it's not touching anything. There's just two forces on it. So here's M2. All right, M2 is five kilograms. What are the two forces on it? Well, there's a force of gravity down. Okay, FG. And don't just set that equal to what it was for M1 because this is a different M. So here, FG, the weight is going to be M2G. All right, and M2 is five kilograms. Multiplied by 10 meters per second squared gives you a weight of 50 newtons. Okay, so this box has a, our block has a uh, weight of 50 newtons. All right, there's also FT up like that, but you don't know it. Okay, and the acceleration is down. Now, 
why didn't I write FT1 and FT2? All right, like why is it the same tension? And the reason is I have it written here. Uh, the tension acting on M1 and M2 are the same in magnitude because of Newton's third law. Okay, now the direction is kind of messed up because of the pulley business, but the magnitudes are the same. So don't write FT1 and FT2. They're really the same FT because of Newton's third law. Because M2 is pulling on M1 through the string and M1 is pulling on M2 through the string, the magnitude of the tension in the string at M1 and M2 are the same. Okay, that is Newton's third law. All right, and play. And so, great. So we got FT there, same FT as in the free body diagram for M1. And we've got a force there of 50 newtons. Which one's going to win? Well, it's accelerating down. So the 50 newtons have to be bigger than FT here. So now we're going to write that the net force, Y direction, because this is vertical. Okay. The net force is going to be the 50 newtons minus the tension, which is trying to, you know, uh, which is uh, competing with the 50 newtons. But the 50 newtons is winning. Okay. So you got 50 newtons minus FT. All right. The tension force. And there you go. That's just the vector sum of it. And that's got to equal Newton's second law to M2A. Why M2? Because this is the free body di diagram for mass number two. Okay. And mass number two is five. And so if we, we put in five for M2 here, we're get going to get this formula. 50 minus FT is equal to 5A. All right. And so now we have two equations with two unknowns, two same unknowns, FT and A. Equation A and equation B. Okay, and I just wrote them here. Here's equation A, FT minus 30 was 10A. And here's equation B, 50 minus FT is 5A. All right, and uh, it always works out this way, that FT will be positive in one equation and negative in the other. All right, try this. I mean, you know, as you do more of these pr types of problems, you'll see that it always works out this way. And so what you can do is you can easily eliminate FT by adding the left-hand side, and the right hand side. If we add up the left hand side, what do we get? Well, we get FT minus 30 plus 50 minus FT plus FT minus FT. The FTs cancel and we'll just get 50 minus 30 on the left hand side. What about the right hand side? We got to add them too. Okay. So we get 10A plus 5A. That's 15A. Okay. And so uh, 50 minus 30 is 20 is equal to 15A. And that tells me that the acceleration is 1.33 meters per second squared. And that's the answer. OK, and so um, once again, uh, you know, I went through a lot of the details and actually before I before I uh, summarize the whole thing, uh, ask yourself, does 1.33 meters per second squared make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, it can't be zero. OK, there's going to be some acceleration and it can't be greater than 10 because that makes no sense. How is it that, you know, you've got this one box being pulled by another box and somehow it magically accelerates more than, you know, a free falling box. That doesn't make sense. It has to be definitely less than 10. And so, yeah, it makes sense that it's like 1.33 meters per second squared. Okay, let's recap the whole thing just in, in quick so we have a, a, a higher level uh, view of what's going on here. So here was the original problem. Uh, mass M1 is attached to mass M2 by a string and pulley system. Mass M1 is sitting on top of a table with coefficient of friction 0.3 and mass M2 is just dangling off the end. Okay, We did the free body diagram for M1 and we found that there are four forces. There's gravity down 100 newtons, the normal force up 100 newtons, the counteractic because there's no acceleration up or down. There's a frictional force 30 newtons to the right because it's uh, 0.3 means it's uh, FF is 30% of FN. And uh, so it's 30 newtons, okay? And FT, we don't know, that's the tension, all right? And so now we have uh, all of our forces and they're making that nice little T so we can add them. And uh, basically all you have that is that FT is competing with FF, but FT is winning. So we have FT minus the 30 newtons must equal M1A, all right? That's Newton's second law. So we just uh, substitute in for M1, 10, newton, uh, 10 uh, kilograms there, and we get that FT minus 30 is 10 times A. There's equation A, all right? Uh, two unknowns are FT and A. Can't solve it with just uh, uh, one equation, all right? And then we did the free body diagram for number two. Uh, that free body diagram has uh, two forces. We've got the weight down, 50 newtons. Okay, and we've got FT up. We don't know how big that is. And uh, the 50 newtons down must be winning. And so we have that the net force is 50 minus FT. That must equal, because of Newton's second law, M2 times A. M2 is 5 kilograms. And so we have that 50 minus FT is 5A. There's our second equation. 
We put the two equations on top of one another and we add the left hand side of both equations together. Ft minus 30 plus 50 minus Ft. Ft minus Ft, the Fts cancel. And we get uh, 50 minus 30 on the uh, left hand side. 10a plus 5a is 15a. Solving we get that a is equal to 1.33 uh, meters per second squared. Does the answer make sense? Yeah, it's, it's within the range we expect. Okay. Now I didn't ask at the beginning for Ft, but now that we have a, it's easy to get Ft. You can substitute Ft into either equation A or equation B and you'll get Ft. Okay. And so uh, use equation A to find Ft. All right. And so now we know that A is 1.33. So we get Ft minus 30 is equal to 10 times 1.33. There's your A substituted, value substituted for A. And just solving, that gives you that Ft is 43.3 uh, newtons. OK. And so um, the tension in that string, uh, both at M1, OK, the pull of the string at M1 or the pull of the string at M2 is going to be 43.3 newtons. OK, so great. There's uh, that problem. Uh, let's do another problem now, moving on. Uh, this problem I'm also going to do without any numbers, and uh, you can guess why. It's uh, something you're going to do in the lab, which is Atwood's machine. Okay, So Atwood's machine is a, a, a simple little demonstration of uh, Newton's laws, and basically you have two masses. Uh, I have here M1 and M2. I'm going to make M2 bigger than M1. OK, uh, and uh, we in principle know the value of M1. In principle, we know the value of M2. And it's pretty obvious uh, that uh, in this system, I have M1 attached by a string to M2 like that. And these two circles are pulleys because M2 is bigger. M2 is going to accelerate down and it's going to accelerate M1 up. OK, so here's the string. It goes over pulley number one, pulley number two like that. Because M2 is bigger, it's going to start accelerating down. And as M2 accelerates down, M1 is going to accelerate up. OK, so there you go. There's our situation. And the question is, find the acceleration of the system. Because this is uh, this string is not stretchy, OK, uh, the acceleration of M1 and the acceleration of M2 are the same, but in opposite directions. M2 is going to fall down, and M1 is going to be accelerated up. OK, so find the acceleration of the system. How many masses are there? Two. So you've got to do two free body diagrams. OK, so let's start off with the free body diagram for M1. Uh, that's easy. Here's our uh, our box, our block here like that. We have the, the weight down, which is M1g, and we have the tension up, which is Ft, and the acceleration is up. Which force is winning? Well, if it's accelerating up, Ft must be bigger than M1g. So F net is going to be Ft minus M1g, okay, because the bigger force up has subtracted by the lower force down. That's going to be your net force. So Ft minus M1g, there's your net force, and that's got to equal invoke the second law m1a okay so there's our equation a now this is a little hard because you go well, what do i know and what don't, don't i know here well um you know we're trying to solve for a so what we want is just an equation in which there's an a in principle you're trying to solve for a you know m1 and m2 you know g and you don't know ft so you've got two unknowns a and ft are unknown in this problem and m1 m and g are known OK, and you say, but if I'm known, why can't I put in the numbers? They're known in principle. All right. So you just pretend that M1 is known and G is known and that A is what you're solving for. So by definition, it's unknown and FT is also unknown. OK, so once again, uh, FT is bigger than uh, uh, FG. So the net force is going to be FT minus FG. In other words, FT minus M1G. There's your net force. And Newton's second law says that must equal the mass times the acceleration. The mass is M1 times a. There's your equation number one. All right, free body diagram for number two. Same thing. Looks the same, but now the acceleration is down and m1 is replaced by m2. So now we have the weight is m2g and the tension up is ft. Okay, which one's bigger? Well, it's accelerating down this time, so m2g must be bigger than ft. Okay, so the net force is m2g minus ft and that's got to equal the second law again m2 times a. There's our equation b. Okay, so put the two equations together just like we did before and we get equation a which is ft minus m1g is equal to m1a and equation b which is m2g minus ft is equal to m2a. Okay, add the left hand side together the fts will cancel and we'll get m2g minus m1g is equal to add the right hand sides together m1a plus m2a. Okay, so there you go. I've added the two equations together. Let me group together the uh, M's. 
So uh, on both sides, so I can factor out a G here and I get M2 minus M1 is equal to G. Oh, sorry, uh, M2 minus M1 times G is equal to M1 plus M2 times A. We're solving for A. And so here we have that A is equal to M2 minus M1 divided by M2 plus M1 times G. And this is our formula for Atwin's machine. You're actually going to be experimentally verifying this in the, the lab. Okay, so there you are You're going to be experimentally verifying that. All right, and um, uh, what do you know here and what don't you know? How do you know this is the answer? Because usually you think of an answer as a number. Well, remember, in principle, you know M1. In principle, you know M2. And of course, in principle, you know G. And so you know everything on the uh, right-hand side there, and therefore you can calculate A. In other words, in the lab, you know, rather than redoing this analysis for every value of M1 and M2, you've done that analysis for all possible values of M1 and all possible values of M2. In the lab, you just plug in your M1 and M2 here and you find the A and then you say, oh, did it actually turn out like this when you do the experiment? And that's how you'll experimentally verify uh, this number, okay, or this equation, all right? Now, I don't want to just leave it at this. I want to give you a little bit of intuition. It might help, it might not. Uh, uh, and uh, let's see if we can understand this equation. We could have almost guessed it at the beginning. Let's take a look at the top, and I, I purposely put the m's, or the g with the m's here, okay? So on the top here, I have m2g minus m1g, okay? You could almost think of that as your net force. You say, well, why? Why is that a net force? Well, because, you know, the two masses, I know there's the pulleys in there and everything, but you can think of the two masses as like, you know, here's m2 and here's m1, okay? And I know the pulleys are there, but see, m2 is being pulled in one direction, by a force M2G, and M1 is being pulled in the opposite direction by a force M1G. Okay, I know they're both down, but I'm saying, you know, pretend that it's like this way, like a tug of war. Okay, so M2G in our diagram above is being pulled down, and M1G is being pulled down. That's kind of like they're competing against one another. So if we just put them along a line, you've got M2G pulling to the right here, and M1G pulling to the left, and M2G is bigger than M1G. And so there's like a net force, which is basically M2G minus M1G. Okay, so there's like a net force. And remember what Newton's second law says, A is equal to the net force divided by the mass. So the net force is like M2G minus M1G. Okay, the weight of M2 is competing against the weight of M1. So they tend to subtract to give you your net force. All right. And then uh, what does Newton's second law say? A is equal to F net divided by M. But M here has to be the total mass because it's both M1 and M2 that are being accelerated. So you can imagine M1 and M2 is just kind of stuck together as a, a, a total mass of M1 plus M2 with a force in one direction, M2G, competing against a force in an opposite direction, M1G. And so the total force is M2G minus M1G, and the total mass on the bottom would be M1 plus M2. And there you go. That's actually uh, uh, Newton's second law again. Now this, I, am not, I, I admit, is a non-rigorous kind of an intuitive hand-waving way of, uh, of arguing it, but it, it shows you that Newton's second law is there uh, in in uh, 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 you know even the combined uh, combination of the two masses, there's no contradiction between the third law and the second law. The third law, which allows you to treat these two masses as independent of one another, uh, is totally consistent with trying to treat the two masses as one, and you know eliminating uh, Ft as an internal force. Okay, and this turns out to be the case in like no matter how complicated your situation is all right so it, it seems like the the second law and the first and the third law the second and third law they seem totally different but they're not they actually work out uh, to be um, consistent with one another because internal forces like that ft the ft being the forces that keep m1 and m2 together those internal forces uh, turn out to cancel because of uh, um, the, the third law because they're equal but in opposite directions and so all that's left over is the external forces and it's that total external force that causes the acceleration. The eternal forces which are the um, uh, just the forces that hold the object together uh, they don't contribute to um, to causing any kind of external acceleration. If internal forces could cause Acceler external acceleration, then you could lift yourself off the ground by pulling on your hair. Well, that doesn't work because, you know, you're pulling up on your hair, but your hair is also pulling down on your hand and those two forces will cancel out against one another, which is essentially what's happening here. Uh, I have a diagram here which tries to show it in more abstraction. I don't know if it, you know, will make it worse, but suppose you have three masses, M1 here and here's M2 and M3 
okay and you know there's a force between m1 and m2 but when you're adding up all the forces including the internal ones the third law says well the force from m1 due to m2 and the force on m2 due to m1 they're equal but opposite directions still cancel and the same thing between m1 and m3 those that pair of forces will cancel and between m2 and m3 that pair of forces will cancel so the internal forces they don't contribute what will contribute to the acceleration of the whole thing are the external forces, the unpaired forces. So like FA here, that's just some external force due to something outside of the system of masses. And so that's going to contribute to an overall acceleration. So is FB, so is FC, and so is FD. So, you know, you just add up all the external forces and divide by the total mass, and that'll give you the acceleration of the total uh, system. The internal forces cancelling out because, again, Newton's third law says they're paired equal and opposite direction. And if you add two vectors which are opposite of one another, they cancel. Okay, so I don't know if that helped your intuition or not, but basically that's what's going on in Atwood's machine. The internal force being FT cancels out, okay? And you just get the, the external forces, which is the weight of the one competing with the weight of the other, divided by the total mass, which is M1 plus M2. All right, uh, one more problem and then we're, we're done here. And uh, so this one's going to combine the inclined plane and the two masses. And so what I have here is a, uh, uh, a block M1 on top of a plane, which is inclined at 45 degrees here. And to make life easy, I set mu k equal to zero, which is basically frictionless. Okay. Uh, and I didn't want to overly complicate this problem. So I have M1 here. And it's on a plane which is inclined at 45 degrees like that. And it's attached by a string and pulley to M2, which is dangling off the end here like that. Okay. And um, I didn't write the numbers in here, but I say that M1 is 8 kilograms and M2 is 5 kilograms. Okay. Mu K is 0. All right. Which is frictionless, at least for part A. And I want you to find the acceleration. Now, at this point, <clears throat> I have drawn in the acceleration here. I say that M1 is going to accelerate up and up the incline and m2 is going to accelerate down but is that true do we know what direction it's going to accelerate your intuition may fail you okay and so you know what you just guess and so here i'm just guessing that a is going to be up the incline uh, a for m1 is going to be up the inclined plane and then a for m2 is going to be down now i'm guessing but my guess could be wrong if i guess incorrectly and I solve the entire problem, what will happen is, is that the A that I get at the end will be negative. In which case I'll say, oh, I chose the wrong direction of A from the beginning. A really should have been downhill or up for M2. And I chose the wrong direction, so I got a negative number. So, you know, when your intuition doesn't help or you can't see which one's going to win, like, you know, is M1 pulling down the incline plane going to be bigger than M2 pulling down? If M1 wins, then it's going to the acceleration is going to be opposite the direction I showed you here. Uh, or is M2 going to be strong enough to pull it uh, such that M1 is accelerated up the inclined plane and M2 drops? So you don't know, which is the way I've drawn it in this diagram. You don't know. So you know what you do? Like I said, you guess and then you work through the problem. And if A turns out to be positive, you guess correctly. If A turns out to be negative, it was in the opposite direction to your guess. Okay, so don't worry that your intuition kind of fails you here. Like I said, just may assert a guess and then you will verify that guess is either true or false at the end. Okay, so how do we proceed? Well, two masses. And so um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we look at the free body diagrams for each of them. Uh, the free body diagram for number two, M2, is easiest. So let's start with that one, might as well. So we have here uh, that uh, FG. That's the weight of the uh, uh, block number two is M2G. M2, I said, was five kilograms multiplied by G, which is 10, says that its weight is 50 newtons. So this block has a weight down 50 newtons. FT up, we don't know. Okay, We said that it's accelerating downwards here. And so uh, what that means is that FT must be bigger. I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, FG must be bigger than FT. So we're going to do 50 minus FT must equal M2. The, the mass times the acceleration, okay? And so 50 minus FT, there's your F net, and is equal to 5A, 5 is your M2, and the reason it's equal is because of the second law. Okay, so there's our equation A, all right? Let's do the free body diagram for number, uh, for mass one, okay? So here's our block. There's no friction, so don't worry about that. There's gravity down. And we know how big that is. The weight of this thing is going to be M1G. That's 8 kilograms. I said that M1 was 8. So M, uh, 8 kilograms multiplied by 10 meters per second squared is 80 newtons. 
So it has a weight of 80 newtons down. There's a normal force perpendicular and a tension up parallel to the plane. Okay. So FG, we have to break it up into its X and Y components the way we've been doing. And so here we go. We've got uh, uh, FGX, sorry, FGY down like that. That's M1G cosine theta. So that's 8 times 10 times a cosine of 45 degrees. Turns out to be 56.6 newtons. Okay. FGX. That's mg1, m1g sine theta. So that also turns out to be 56.6 newtons. So both components, because this is at 45 degrees, it turns out that both components, both the x and y component of fg are going to be 56.6 newtons. Well, the box isn't accelerating parallel to the, uh, sorry, uh, perpendicular to the plane, only parallel. And therefore, the fgy must equal fn. So Fn must also be 56.6 newtons, okay? And Ft we don't know. But we do know that it has to be bigger than 56.6. Why? Because we said it's accelerating uphill. So Ft must be bigger, winning the tug of war against uh, the 56.6, okay? So the net force is going to be Ft minus 56.6. There's your F net. That's got to equal Ma. M in this case, M1 is 8 times a and we don't know a okay and that equality of course holds because of the second law so there we go there's our equation b so we have an equation a and an equation b we'll write both one on top of the other so here's equation a 50 minus ft is equal to 5a that's for m2 and ft minus 56.6 is equal to 8a if we add the left hand side 50 minus ft plus ft minus 56.6 we'll see that, that uh, the FTs cancel and we'll get 50 minus 56.6. And that's got to equal, add the right-hand sides, 5 plus 8 is 13A, like that. So 5A plus 8A is 13A. And when we solve here, we find that, aha, A is equal to negative 0.51 meters per second squared. Okay, it's negative. And what did we say? Well, we must have guessed wrong. And so when we go to, you know, write out the final answer we would say that this thing is accelerating at 0.51 meters per second squared in the direction indicated in this diagram it turns out that m2 is actually accelerated up and m1 is actually accelerated down the incline plane which was the opposite of our original assumption so again we started off with an assumption that you know the accelerations were was going to be like this with the arrows drawn here m1 up and m2 down M1 up the incline plane, M2 straight down, okay? Turns out that A turned out to be negative, so our assumption for the direction of A was wrong. Therefore, in, in reality, if we did the experiment, we would find A in the opposite direction. That is M1 down the incline plane and M2 vertically up, okay? Great. Now, and this is about as hard as these problems are gonna get, I won't throw anything like more complicated than this, how big does mu s have to be such that the system doesn't move? Okay, so you know we've got these two and if there's no friction there will be an acceleration. But now I'm going to turn on some friction and uh, I'm going to turn on some mu s. If mu s is too small, if there isn't enough static friction, well then it'll still accelerate. But if mu s is bigger than a certain threshold then it won't. Now you can make mu s really, really big and you'll be guaranteed. So really what I'm asking for is what's the minimum value of mu s such that it won't accelerate, okay? So remember, you know, this is an inequality here because if mu s was like a million, okay, well then yeah, it's not going to accelerate. If it's 2 million, it's not going to accelerate. If it's 3 million, it's not going to accelerate. So if it's a really, really big number, it's not going to accelerate. And the bigger you make the number, the more it's not going to accelerate. It's as you make mu s smaller and smaller and smaller, you realize that at some point, if you make mu s too small, that it will accelerate. And so what I'm asking for is, what is the minimum value of mu s such that the system is static? Static meaning doesn't move, okay? And so um, first thing I note is, let's be careful. I know we just solved this problem, but we didn't really solve this exact problem. We solved the variation on this problem. So don't just magically pull ft from the previous problem. In fact, what you'll discover is that ft is different in this case, okay? And so, um, so as an aside, if we went back to part a and we solve for ft, 
we would get 52.55 newtons. Okay, so we only solve for A, but all you have to do is take A, which we found to be 0.51, substitute it into either equation A and B, and you would get that the tension in part A is 52, 52.55 newtons. Be careful, don't just use that in part B, because part B is a totally different situation. Okay, even though the, the physical setup is the same, we don't have an acceleration, and that means that FT is going to be different. We'll actually see that. Okay, so um, it'll turn out that in part B, because the um, uh, the acceleration is zero, Ft will have to be zero. And you could see that, sorry, Ft will have to be 50 newtons. You could see that because if you do the free body diagram for, for number two, so here's the free body diagram, here's M2, the, the mass that's dangling. We know that it has a weight of 50 newtons, that's M2g, okay? And M2 was five, so five times 10 is 50 newtons. That means that Ft must be 50 newtons. Why? Because M2 is not accelerating at all. And therefore, Ft must exactly match Fg in order for the two to cancel to give you no net force for no acceleration. And so look at what happened there. In part A, if we had solved for Ft, we would have found that it was 52.55 newtons. But in part B of the problem, it turns out that the tension is 50 newtons. So different situation, different tension. Okay. So be careful if you're doing variations of the problem, like rethink the problem from scratch. A lot of the numbers might be the same, but some small little change might mean that, you know, one of the numbers is not the same and you got, you got to identify those. Okay. And so here, once again, if we start off with a free body diagram for M2, it has a weight of 50 newtons that must be exactly balanced by the tension of 50 newtons okay so we know that ft is 50 newtons now let's go to the free body diagram for <coughs> um, for number one the tension is 50 newtons why we just determined that from m2 so the tension is 50 newtons we have two components for gravity okay the y component which is m1 g cosine uh, theta and plugging in all the numbers you'll still get 56.6 uh, you have the x component which is m1g sine theta and plugging in all the numbers you'll get 56.6 that didn't change from part a so that's still the same so now we have ft we have the x and y components the x and y components of fg the normal force has to exactly balance the uh, the y component of the gravitational force so that 56.6 must be balanced by that 56.6 and so we've got all the forces here except you also need what static friction to prevent the thing from moving okay now how big is that static friction I don't know but it has to be whatever value such that when we add all of these the net force is zero okay so I say that in my next statement here fs that is the force of static friction must be whatever such that the net force is zero. Now, I know that it's 6.6 .6 newtons. Why? Well, Fn and the y component of Fg, they cancel. So don't worry about the forces that are perpendicular to the plane here like that. Okay. Just look at the forces that are parallel to the plane. We have a force which is 56.6 down and we have a force which is 50 up. And that means that there's an unbalance of 6.6. .6. So there's 56.6 .6 down. 50 up, so we need another 6.6 .6 up to make sure that the force is up the inclined plane and the force is down the inclined plane balance. And so Fs must equal 6.6 .6 such that the net force is zero. And that's basically Newton's first law because you know this is a situation of static friction. Static means nothing is moving. That means the acceleration is zero. That means all the net forces have to equal zero. Okay. So once again, we have 50 Newtons up plus the 6.6 .6 from the static friction for a total of 56.6 .6 Newtons up the inclined plane. And that's going to balance 56.6 .6 Newtons down the inclined plane so that there is no net force in the x direction. And also there's no net force in the y direction leading to static. Okay. Now, that's not, you know, we've gotten we mostly analyzed the problem, but that's not what I'm asked, what I asked for. What I asked for is how small can you make mu s? Okay, so over here we have the inequality involving mu s and the stat force of static friction and the normal force. Okay, so we have mu s, and notice that mu s can go as big as it wants, but it kind of has a, 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 a minimum. Okay, that it can't get smaller than it has to be bigger than this uh, than this minimum. Okay, and what is that? Well, we know that the force of static friction is now 6.6 .6 newtons, and we also know from the diagram that the normal force is 56.6 .6 newtons. So if you divide those two, you get 0.12, and that means that mu s has to be bigger than 0.12 in order for there not to be any slipping. Okay, all right. So if mu s were less than point 
0.12, then it would start to slide. All right. But if mu s is bigger than 0.12, then you have static friction. It doesn't tell you how the exact value of mu s. Mu s could be 1 and it would not slide. It could be 2 and it won't slide. It could be 3 and it won't slide. That's the nature of the inequality. It just kind of gives you a threshold. What is that threshold? 0.12. Mu s must be bigger than 0.12 for it not to slide. If it is less than 0.12, then it will definitely slide. And that's basically, that 0.12 is basically your minimum value of mu s. If you want an equation for the minimum value, okay, if I said minimum value of mu s, that's basically the, the equality inside of this inequality. So mu s minimum is force of static friction over f at, okay? But, you know, that, that's that's kind of a narrow way to, to view this uh, problem. It's the better way to view it is that uh, mu s could be bigger than a certain threshold amount. What is that threshold amount? 0.12 in this case. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, the end of the lecture. Uh, lots of problems here. You may want to watch this video again or maybe watch some parts of it, uh, parts that you didn't quite get. But um, during our tutorial sessions, um, we will uh, I'll actually go through these kinds of problems with you. Okay, uh, the way you could study on your own here is, you know, I've given you some problems. Uh, just redo the problems. You could redo the problems with my numbers. You could change the numbers. Okay. Uh, basically on a test, I'm not going to give you something that is so wildly different than what I did. That, that would be not fair. I'll give you some variation on what I've done. Okay. Uh, in this lecture. So if you can do the problems that I've done here, and then you could do them when you start to vary the numbers and, you know, start to vary maybe a couple of things. They're not that much that you can vary, but you can you know, vary a few things. And uh, uh, if you could do those problems with those variations, then chances are you'll be just fine on the, on the test. Okay. And uh, if you're still not sure, well, then we'll do some of these problems together uh, in our tutorial sections. Okay. So uh, thank you. That's the, uh, the end of our lecture.